you. Thank you. It's marvelous to be here. We have with us today a most remarkable man. Born in Dunfermline, Scotland in the year 18, the great makers of their own fortunes began closer to absolute zero. Through sagacity, self-culture, and hard work, he rose to unparalleled heights. Horatio Alger's story, success built upon success. His work, and in the arts, is known worldwide. Would you welcome, please, Mr. Andrew Carnegie. Carnegie. Hi, and uh, how are you, sir? Can I help you with this? <clears throat> mm. Consider of you to leave the comforts of Skibo Castle for this interview. Oh, it's a pleasure. I always grant a birthday interview anyway. Yes, and uh, what birthday? Uh, sure. uh, how is it that you purchased Skibo Castle? Uh, well, that was after the birth of my daughter, Margaret, named after my mother, uh, when Louise said to me, in the summer home since this one has been given to us. She insisted that it be in the highlands of Scotland. <laughs> Bless her soul, she is much more Scotch than I. Now, how is it that you met Mrs. Carnegie? Uh, we used to go for long rides in the park together. Uh, her name was Louise Whitfield then, and despite the difference in our ages, I knew from the beginning that she was special. Of course, marriage was out of the question at the time because of my dear mother, for you see, I was her closest companion. I was the only one of her family who had not either died or left home. <laughs> Mr. Carnegie, uh, throughout your life you've done a great deal to help the needy. What are your views on social reform? Well, I believe that man has an obligation to help his fellow man. Uh, many people believe my views are too radical on the issue of social reform, but, but I cannot agree. As a small boy, I lived in a small town outside of Philadelphia. We needed money so badly that I had to take on the job of the boiling room of a wool shop because it paid 20 more cents a week than my job as a bobbin boy. <laughs> it was a terrible occupation, working in a dank cellar. <laughs> I had to take wads of new wool and dip them into a vat of stinking oil. To this day, the smell of oil makes me nauseous. But what a change a telegraph office was to me then. My good ferry found me in a cellar, frying a boiler and a little steam engine, and carried me into the bright and sunny office. I was doing the work of a man, and was the happiest boy alive. Mr. Carnegie, when you said that man has an obligation to help his fellow man, do you mean everyone? Do you believe, for example, that the poor have an obligation to the rich? Oh, absolutely. If a rich man dispenses his fortune for the betterment of the general public, then the public should make the best possible use of it. People should make every effort to uplift themselves. The reconciliation of the poor and the rich comes thusly. It is founded upon the present most intense individualism, and under its sway we shall have an ideal state in which the surplus wealth of the few will become, in the best sense, the property of the many because administered for the common good. And this wealth, passing through the hands of the few, will be a much more patent force for the elevation of our race than if distributed in small sums to the people themselves. Uh, in short, a rich man should spend his fortune during his lifetime uh, in way that will most effectively benefit and advance society. And this is your gospel of wealth? Well, indeed it is, and I have tried to live by it as best I could. Um, but isn't the enormous distribution of wealth in itself a status symbol? Uh, didn't you and John D. Rockefeller get into an undeclared contest to see who could donate more? You won in the end with 332 million. <laughs> Saints alive! Was it that much? <laughs> Where did I get all that money? <laughs> well, as for Rockefeller, if I goaded him into parting with some of his treasure, it's all for the best. Well, I'd rather he'd read my book and done it himself. Mr. Carnegie, what do you consider to be the three great turning points in your life? Well, coming to America has got to be the first. Uh, receiving my first dividend check was an enormous thrill to me. It was the first time I had gotten money that was not the direct result of the sweat off my brow. Uh, and the third... Uh, well, I believe it had to be the year 1886. Uh, my mother, my brother Tom and I had just returned from our trip from Europe when we all took in. Uh, I had typhoid, mother contracted pneumonia, and Tom had the fever. I was just beginning to recover when I received the news that my brother uh, had died. 
Well, I relapsed into a feverish coma. Oh. Meanwhile, my mother passed on. I was not told of that until later. <laughs> Yet, when I recovered, I found myself alone in the world. Well, I turned to that angel on earth, Louise Whitfield, and we were married. For you see, she wanted to marry someone she could help and support, and up until then, I had everything that I needed. Mr. Carnegie, you're very well read, especially for a self-taught man. What prompted you to seek an education? Well, I have always loved to read. Uh, even as a small boy, I used to uh, borrow books and spend my free time huddled over them. Uh, my business rarely brought me into contact with men of culture or learning, so I had to seek intellectual stimulation elsewhere. I was lucky enough to be invited into the social circle of Madame Botter. Her parlor walls had, held, had heard some of the thoughts of the most celebrated minds of the 19th century, from Edgar Allan Poe to Ralph Waldo Emerson. It was there that my latent opinions were given a chance to bloom. Mr. Carnegie, your political support has been vast and varied. What do you consider to be the most important single political event that you've ever been involved in? Well, I, I would say my delegation to the World Peace Conference, but, but I believe that's above politics. Uh, as for my political career being vast and varied, well, my family has always been very politically oriented. <clears throat> I come from a, a long line of chartists and have always detested hereditary rank of all kinds. Uh, one of my proudest boasts was that my uncle was in prison for uplifting the rights of the people and vindicating the liberty of free speech. As a young man, I was a strong anti-slavery partisan and I hailed with enthusiasm the first national meeting of the Republican Party. Uh, do you, Mr. Carnegie, but you've stated that the commercial morality is now very high and that uh, sharp dealing has nothing to do with honorable business. Yet isn't it true that in 1888, when the Black Diamond Steelworks announced their innovation of moving steel ingots directly from the soaking pits to the rolling mills, thus the eliminating costly reheating and bringing down the price of rails, you issued a circular to railroad officials stating that rails rolled in this manner were faulty due to a lack of homogeneity? And when the Black Diamond Works went bankrupt for lack of sales, you bought them out, along with this so-called faulty process, which you used in all your mills from that time onward, and there was no more talk of homogeneity or the lack of it. Wouldn't you call this illegitimate business tactics? Under ordinary circumstances, we would not have thought it legitimate. But the competition set up by the Duquesne people was also not legitimate. Because of their use of this direct rolling process, they were a thorn in our flesh. And they reduced the price of rates. But did you ever fail to take advantage of any technological advancement that brought down prices and gave you the edge on competition? Of course not. The, the most important rule of any kind of manufacturing, uh, be it basic materials or finished products, is this. Watch the costs and let the profits take care of themselves. <laughs> I would think nothing of spending half a million dollars on equipment that would cut costs and put your money back into the company. I have never believed in big salaries or dividends. The best kind of reimbursement is that which ties a man to his company, makes him a partner, lets the interest of the company be his interest. Mr. Carnegie, your company has always been run by a small handful of men. Why is this? Uh, my company has always been a tight-knit association of investors who were active participants in the running of the firm. Schwab, Frick, Phipps, Lauder, all held active positions on the board of directors. And yet you never held any post personally. <laughs> no. <laughs> I owned the company. Ah, yes. <laughs> <laughs> no. Uh, actually, although I held no specific post, I was active in the company decision-making. <laughs> As I've always said, put all your eggs in one basket and watch that basket. <laughs> Isn't that a quote from Mark Twain? Uh, no, he borrowed it from me. <laughs> Mr. Carnegie, if you were to give advice to the young businessmen of today, what would it be? Well, one very major rule is to avoid overcapitalization. Uh, I have seen businesses, especially railroads, collapse at the first shockwave of depression because they cannot meet dividends on stocks that were grossly inflated over the real value of the company's holding and potential earning power. I would never put a company in mortgage to the New York Stock Exchange. Also, a company should hold back a percentage of its profits in a financial reserve. <laughs> Remember, the man who has money during a panic 
is a wise and worthy citizen. I made certain that all Carnegie Steel stockholders were wise and worthy. <laughs> Mr. Carnegie, you are the creator of the first truly vertical company in the history of business. You owned everything from the lime and coal fields to the factories that created the finished steel products. All three stages of the production of steel and steel byproducts was under your control. Your company was a virtual monopoly that made free competition an impossibility. This has put you in the category of robber baron. <laughs> How do you feel about this? The robber baron has ceased to rob and is being robbed. Yeah, now my answer and the eighth wonder of the world is this. Two pounds of iron stone purchased on the shores of Lake Superior and transported to Pittsburgh. Two pounds of coal mined in Cornersville, manufactured into one and one quarter pounds of coke and brought to Pittsburgh. One quarter pound of limestone mined east of the Alleghenies and brought to Pittsburgh. A little manganese ore mined in Virginia and brought to Pittsburgh. And these four and one half pound of material manufactured into one pound of solid steel and... You're not trying that to... Is that all need be said about the steel? You're not trying to. Carnegie Steel didn't make... ...to say, need to sell high-grade steel so cheaply. <laughs> but didn't you engage in all kinds of speculation early in your... In 1868, you had investments in uh, 16 companies, ranging from oil refinery to oil industry. I never liked oil as a substance or a business. I gladly... Carnegie, you're quite an entrepreneur. When it came to securing a loan or selling a product, you, you had your share of wheeling and dealing. I never denied having the gift of persuasion. Uh, as you would call it, is my fine track record. <laughs> my wheelings and dealings were backed by more than gab. They were backed by quality. Oh, and... Yes, I have had trouble with the railroads on and off throughout my pro several lines, and I lower rates as other firms. Now I know what I'm speaking about. My last salary job was with the Pennsylvania. I had good terms with the Pennsylvania back when J. Edgar Thomas, the namesake of our steel mill at Braddock, owned it. Did you realize? But I had implicit faith in Frick and his managers at Homestead. Ah, yes. Henry Clay Frick, a well-known anti-labor man. The bravest man that I have ever known, completely devoted to his work uh, and strongly anti-union. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> he had an eye on, did you know that after the militia was brought in and uh, they had restored order at Homestead, uh, Frick was sitting, a young immigrant from Lithuania, burst into the office and shot Frick twice in the neck. Uh, one bullet lodged near the base of grabbed the man as he fired again, and the shot went to self, tackled the would-be assassin to the floor, and was subsequently stabbed three times in the hips and legs. That time, a deputy sheriff was in the office, ready to shoot Buckman, but Frick stopped him, saying, No, 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 don't shoot, to see his face. Frick pointed to Buckman's jaw, which was moving spasmodically, as if he was chewing. When the sheriff pried open his mouth, they found a capsule containing enough fulminite of mercury to blow. Uh, sat down in his chair while a hastily summoned surgeon probed for bullets. After profusely bleeding wounds were dressed, he sent a telegram to his mother and another to me, stating, finished some work on a loan he was negotiating, and finally allowed himself to be ambulanced home. Fantastic. And so we've taken him the liberty of bringing him here tonight. Ladies and gentlemen, and... Andrew Con to handle men. Though he never knew where to draw the line, he spoke too freely. The merging of our companies was good. Financial point of view, but personally, it was a, a mediocre success. He had majority control of my company, and I was not a man who could tolerate control, even if it was benevolent. His brother Tom, on the other hand, was a... He had the love and quiet respect of every man in the firm. Completely trustworthy. Tom was more reserved and conservative than his brother. And he often in the beginning, but he became less and less so as the years went by. He took to drinking, and that eventually led to his death. If in compensation for the loss of his brother, this led to the disillusion of our relationship but I hold no bitterness. Thank you for coming, Mr. Frick. Uh, tell me, did the incident that Mr. Carnegie has just described have any effect on your attitude towards organized labor? No, the attempted assassination did not change our attitudes toward the uh, Amalgamated Association of Steelworkers. I have said as much so in my statement to the press. 
Uh, what did you do when you saw you were going to have trouble with the workers at Homestead? Barricaded the plant so it could be defended and contact the Pinkerton Agency. You, you wanted to bring in, you intended from the first to bring in strike breakers? Yes. Were you prepared to extend the, con the uh, conflict over a long period of time? Yes, if necessary. And what about Carnegie? That the unions had to be, he didn't agree with the use of strike breakers. He uh, subscribed to closing down the plant and waiting the workers out. Did you keep in close contact with the con? Close enough to keep him far away. Uh, Phipps and Lauder saw to it that he didn't speak to the press. The last thing we needed was to have to accomplish. Carnegie let me handle it in my own way. He had to. He knew that if he interfered, he would lose both the battle with me and the unions. I would have left it. Well, the Homestead Mills had been for three years in the hands of the unions due to the gutless mismanagement of the director. I offered the union terms that seemed acceptable to me. If they didn't like them, that was their business. I welcomed some final decision on the matter. They chose not to accept them and walked out. I informed the Pinkerton men to... However, those union men were keeping a sharp watch on the river and they spotted the guards. The Pinkerton men never reached the docks. Yes, with the local workers. However, they still fired them and hired Hungarians. Eventually, the same thing happened. No matter what a destitute a group of men are, just give them time and they'll ask for more. Uh, richly stocked with diverse ethnic groups. Mm -hmm. The treaty you offered the unions was designed to bring about a strike, was it not? Not only they wouldn't accept them. <laughs> but didn't you, for all intents and purposes, refuse to negotiate with union representatives? Didn't your proposal call for reduced wages and an uncomplimentary termination date on the contract? Yes. And you considered the result confrontation a success? Yes, we had no more trouble at the Homestead plant. Mr. Carnegie, <coughs> why did you and Mr. Frick dissolve your relationship? Oh, our relationship was not dissolved. It was dis uh, Mr. Frick could not seem to grasp the fact that what was good for Carnegie Steel was good for Frick Coke. He was continually putting the interest of his firm first when they were actually one. There were also some bad business maneuvers. Such as your attempt to expel me, me from the company with a fraction of what my holdings were worth, holding the ironclad agreement over everyone's head but your own. Your handling of the homestead business and your backing out on your agreement about the cost of coke led to your expulsion from Carnegie Company. Mr. Carnegie seems to forget that he gave me a blank check on the homestead business. Neither he nor I were authorized to make a final decision between the firms. If, if the men who own controlling majority of the stock can't make decisions, <laughs> who can? The men specifically designated for the job. Schwab told you that the deal would have to be renegotiated and put down on paper. It seems to me, Mr. Frick, that you use the same tactics against the unions that you used against uh, Mr. Carnegie. Force a confrontation and use it for your own benefit. Uh, Mr. Carnegie, why did your first negotiation to sell your holdings and retire fall through? Well, the balance uh, to the payment was not raised within the allotted time, which was just as well with me, uh, since the, uh, <clears throat> the, secret, the secret client who was interested in buying me out was a shady speculator of the worst description. <laughs> Mr. Frick, that deal together. Yeah. And you kept the million-dollar collateral on that deal, most of which was my money. Yes, we used up to fix up Skibo Castle, <laughs> putting in the waterfall in the saltwater pool. It came in very handily. Thank you. You know, when you built your new years after I retired, I sent a letter to you stating that bygones should be bygones and inviting you up to see me. Do you remember your reply? I'll see you in hell. Uh, Mr. Carnegie, what exactly are your attitudes towards labor? The Forum magazine in 1886 are very pro-labor, and I quote, the right of the working man to combine and form trade unions is no less than the right of the manufacturer to enter into associations and conferences with his fellows. It must sooner or later be conceded to Frick to meet the Homestead strike head-on by declaring non-unionization. What accounts for this inconsistency? There, there are two reasons I push for a declaration of non-unionization. Firstly, the strikers did not in any way represent the, work, the majority of the workers. And secondly, 
Uh, mm -hmm. The kind of unions that I have always given praise to have been those that uh, have worked within the company, not on a national scale. <laughs> if company unionism isn't it, then I insist upon non-unionization. But isn't it true that at the time of the Homestead strike, your company was in a period of overproduction and couldn't you easily go on strike? In fact, wasn't it an ideal time for you to have a decisive clash with the unions? Didn't you write to your plant manager and instruct him to roll off a lot of steel plate ahead of time, your only pressing order, so you'd be free of responsibilities when the strike came? I ask you, sir, to remember that the strike was forced upon us. The entire incident had been a painful blotch on my career. But I can guarantee you one thing. If I had been there at the time of the strike, no blood would have been spilled. Then you do, not that despite, you do not deny that despite your many statements about the benefits of unions to employers, as well as employee, that you were bent upon removing all union control from your company. I do not deny that I was and am against this sort of nationalized union, not all unions. What about your attacks on the Knights of Labor? The Knights of Labor was a crude, entirely too all-inclusive. <laughs> you cannot combine common, unskilled labor with skilled. M one mistake that many writers make about labor is dealing with it as if it were one class or more grades to labor than in educated society. Mr. Carnegie, you have been labeled... I have never claimed to be the world's greatest philanthropist. Men like Enoch Pratt and Peter Cooper pioneered this way before me. Uh, but I am a scientist, uh, and although distributing my wealth this way has been more tedious, I believe it has done more general good than just random donation. Uh, I always tried to handle my philanthropy as I did my business, systematically. Uh, remember, a man who dies rich dies rich. Uh, when did you first begin to distribute your wealth? Uh, after my book, The Gospel of Wealth, was published. It was inevitable that I should live up to its teachings by ceasing to struggle for more wealth. Uh, I'm accumulating and begin the infinitely more serious and difficult task of wise distribution. Uh, I knew the task of distribution before me would be in old age to the utmost. But as usual, Shakespeare had placed his talismanic touch upon the thought and framed the sentence. So distribution should undo excess and each man have enough. The first fund that I ever set up was for the workers at Homestead and the other mills. The first library that I ever built was in the place of my birth, Dumfline, Scotland. <laughs> You'll have to forgive me for putting my native town first on the list. My mother laid the cornerstone, and it was a grand day, generally. <laughs> the public library, uh, to me, represented the best kind of uplifting effect, that of self-improvement. Here was a place that any man could go to better himself. It was this kind of institution that I put my faith in. <laughs> Let others do work for the benefit of this submerged tent. Mr. Carnegie, in what field was the majority of your money spent? Uh, for the improvement of the mind. Uh, I have never supported any religious groups except for the uh, donating of church organs. <laughs> As a matter of fact, the church organ is a good example of how a simple piece of charity can swell into full-time philanthropy. I donated an organ to the church my father had attended. Well, within a year, I was donating pipe organs right and left. By the year 1919, I had given away nearly seven and a half thousand organs. So you can see that I had to keep tight ramifications on the giving of my gifts. You never supported uh, science and medicine as you did education. Why is this? Uh, well, as I have always said, a man must choose one line of work and stick to it. Education became the field of my choice, the betterment of the mind through the extension of knowledge. The Carnegie Institution was set up with that precept in mind. Uh, President Roosevelt was proud to serve on his board, as were many other distinguished men. Uh, the Hero Fund, established in 1904, has proved to be, from a point of view, a decided success. Uh, I cherish a fatherly regard for it, since no one suggested it to me. <laughs> as far as I know, it had never even been thought of. It is emphatically my own bane. <laughs> uh, my fourth important gift was a $15 million pension fund for aged university professors established in 1905. Uh, this fund is for veterans. Teaching is the most unfairly and, yes, the most meanly paid, though it should rank with the highest. And what was the endow endowment for the Carnegie Foundation for the Advancement of Teaching? Uh, about $30 million. 
As I understand it, Mr. Carnegie, the Carnegie Teachers Fund had a profound effect on the quality of education in the United States. School teachers, those that did not, their standards so they could. This put pressure on the preparatory schools to come up to the new university standards. Hmm. It was so successful in the private system that it was later expanded to the public university. That was the additional 15 million. In my various articles compiled and called the Gospel of Wealth, I propounded that the rich man should distribute his monies personally. I tried to do so at first. In my first year of retirement, I gave away nearly $19 million. Well, I thought I was doing pretty good, but when I checked the figures, I found that I had accumulated more than that in interest alone. <laughs> I assumed that a specialization would be needed to handle charity on this kind of scale. Uh, therefore, I established the Carnegie Foundation. Uh, it had this, an entirely good charity. <laughs> and how much was the uh, endowment? It was about uh, $125 million. Ah, I see. Um, Mr. Carnegie, exactly how much did you receive upon uh, selling your holdings in Carnegie Company? Well, that was just about nearly uh, $500 million. Oh, and who did you sell out to? Uh, J.P. Morgan and Sons, bankers. <clears throat> I said I thought was reasonable, and he paid it. Uh, I've been told since that I should have held out for more, but what would have been the point? Uh, besides, a deal with more from they are as dependable as the sunrise. Uh, Carnegie Steel was absorbed into the creation of United States Steel, the first billion-dollar company in uh, the history of business. Alas, the... The days of the personally owned and run company are over. <laughs> uh, the environment where a man can leave a mark and his own company, I'm afraid, are gone and those days are never to return. Uh, we are on the of the super company and a vast corporate machine. How did your friends and family feel about your retirement from business? Well, I believe uh, both my, my were pleased to see me get down from the saddle. Louise and little Margaret were happy, I know. Uh, not that I ever let business uh, run my everyday affairs. <laughs> uh, happy for the summer months. Mm. Uh, but my, my favorite friend, uh, John Morley, uh, hailed my retirement from business with his usual quiet approval. <laughs> now, congratulations in the world. Yet none of my friends hailed retirement from business more warmly than Mark Twain. <laughs> Those that were intimate with Mr. Clemens will certify that he was one of the charmers. Such people brighten the lives of their friends regardless of themselves. The public only knows one side of Mr. Clemens, the amusing part. Yet little do they know that he is a man of strong convictions upon political and social questions and a moralist of no mean order. He was a man of unmatched wit, style, and sorrow. I received a following note from him uh, during a time in which the newspapers were talking much about my wealth. Uh, Dear friend and sir, you seem to be in prosperity. <laughs> Could you lend an admirer a dollar and a half to buy a hymn book with? <laughs> I'm sure God will bless you for it. I know it. I feel it. So will I. <laughs> if there are other applications, this one not to count. <laughs> Yours truly, Mark. P.S. Don't send the hymn book. Send the money. I wish to make the selection myself. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the reports of my death have been... Uh, greatly exaggerated. Andrew Carnegie has bought fame and paid cash for it. He has deliberately projected and planned out his fame for himself. He has arranged that his name shall be famous in the mouths of men for centuries to come. He has planned shrewdly, securely, and uh, will have his desire. <laughs> I think that uh, Three or four centuries from now, Carnegie libraries will be uh, considerably thicker in the world than churches. <laughs> it is a long-headed idea, and will deceive many people into thinking Carnegie a long-headed man in many a small, wise way. The way of the trimmer, the way of the smart calculator, the way that 
enables a man to correctly calculate the tides and come in with the flow and go out with the ebb, keeping a permanent place on top of the wave of advantage, while other men, as intelligent as he, but uh, more addicted to principles and less to policy, and get stranded on the reefs and bars. Now, uh, he has never a word of brag about his real achievements. They do not seem to interest him in the least degree. He is only interested, and intensely interested, in the flatteries lavished upon him in the disguise of compliments and in other little vanities which other men would value but uh, conceal. I, I must repeat, he is an astonishing man in his genuine modesty as regards the large things he has done <laughs> and in his juvenile delight in trivialities that feed his vanity. <laughs> Mr. Carnegie is uh, not any better acquainted with himself than if he had met himself for the first time the day before yesterday. <laughs> he thinks he is a rude, bluff, independent spirit who writes and speaks his mind with an almost extravagant Fourth of July independence whereas he is really the counterpart of the rest of the human race in that he does not boldly speak his mind, except when there isn't any danger in it. He thinks he is a scorner of kings and emperors and dukes, whereas he is like the rest of the human race. A slight attention from one of these can make him drunk for a week and keep his happy tongue wagging for seven years. Seems alive. Mark! Oh, I didn't know I'd been canonized. Somebody upstairs must have made a mistake. Thank you, Mr. Twain. Oh, not at all, not at all. It uh, oh, serves to break the monotony. <laughs> things get pretty dull around here sometimes. So, Andy, how are things in the millionaire business? <laughs> Great. How are things in the laughter department? Good. Say, uh, Andy, how old are you? 84. Hmm, not bad. I only made it to 70. You didn't smoke or drink. <laughs> Took you 10 years, I believe, to donate all your money away. I could have done it for you in 10 weeks. <laughs> I have no doubt of it, Mark. No, that especially considering your vast and varied career in the monetary world. Andrew, you and I would have made a great team. You'd uh, make all the money, and then uh, I'd uh, lose it, don't you know? <laughs> <laughs> you want to know, Mark? I owe my vigorous and healthy old age to my abstemious habits. <laughs> the only physician I ever needed was Dr. Goff. <laughs> and I took that up at 63. We ought to play around sometime, Mark. When I play around, it uh, won't be with you, Andy. <laughs> <laughs> my restraints never stopped you from enjoying yourself. No, sir, that's, uh, that's true. And that fine Scotch whiskey you used to send me, <clears throat> it was the smoothest on the planet. <laughs> You know, <clears throat> Andy, you remind me of an elderly lady friend of mine. Well, now, <laughs> she had gone down and down and down to the point where medicine no longer had any helpful effect on her. And I told her that all she would have to do would be to give up smoking and drinking and swearing. And by the end of the week, well, she'd be on her feet again. Well. She told me that she couldn't give up smoking, or drinking, or swearing, simply because she'd never done any of those <laughs> things. <laughs> so, there it was. She had neglected her habits. <laughs> Why, well, goodness knows, just one or two little bad habits might have saved her. <laughs> She was a sinking ship with no freight to throw overboard. <laughs> you know, there's one thing that you've done more than me, besides drinking and smoking, and that is talking. <laughs> well, I've never known your tongue to stiffen up for lack of use, Andy. <laughs> it's pride that brings a man down, don't you know? Why, there's many a time when I've said, now there's Mr. Carnegie, now 
just out of the affection I bear that man, many a time I have given him points in finance he had never thought of. And if he could simply lay aside envy and prejudice and superstition and utilize those ideas in his business, it would make a difference in his bank account. I would, Mark. I really would, but <laughs> I'd hate to see the empire I've spent my life building tumble at a blow. <laughs> you hear that? Hard, bitter words at the hands of a man whom I have treated with nothing but kindness. Why, just look at that foxy, cunning little white-whiskered face which thrills to transparent tokens of reverence for his money bags. <laughs> I'd go into business with you, Mark. I, I really would. But I've always tried to avoid high-risk speculation. <laughs> of course, we all know you're the modern Midas. Everything you touch turns to stainless steel. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm not worried, since all's well, since all grows better. You, uh, believe that? I do. I wish I had your faith, nor your blindness. Why, all I have to do to reaffirm my opinions is to open the newspaper, knowing full well that I shall find in it the usual sort of depravities and baseness and hypocrisies and cruelties that make up civilization and cause me to put in the rest of the day pleading for the damnation of the human race. <laughs> yes, there, there are atrocities and cruelties, but, but they are only part of an evolving process. They are evils that will be weeded out as man develops toward his goal. What goal? Man originally started out just uh, a little bit lower than the angels, and uh, he's been getting a little lower ever since. <laughs> <laughs> to place him <coughs> properly at the present time, I'd say he stands somewhere between the angels and the French. <laughs> I wish I had been aboard the ark with an auger. <laughs> <laughs> now, what about progress, Mr. Twain? Progress? Well, this is a time of progress. Ours is a civilization of progress. This is a progressive land, a great and glorious land, too. A land which has developed a Washington, a Franklin, a Boss Tweed, a Longfellow, a recent Congress which has never had its equal in some respects, and uh, a United States Army which conquered 60 Indians in eight months by tiring them out, <laughs> which is uh, better than uncivilized slaughter, God knows. We have a criminal jury system which is superior to any in the world and its efficiency is only marred by the difficulty of finding 12 men every day who don't know anything and can't read <laughs> and uh, I observe we have an insanity plea which would have saved Cain <laughs> no I think I can say and say with pride that we have some legislatures in this country which would bring higher prices than any in the world. Well, how do you feel about mankind? Oh. Mankind? Mankind? Oh, oh, my goodness, I have always had a deep and abiding love for mankind. But it wore off. <laughs> Man, man is the only animal that deals in the atrocity of war. Yes. Andy, I know how you work for peace. And uh, although we may not agree as to the eventual outcome, I appreciate all the time and effort that has gone into it. I admire it. It is a noble goal. <coughs> but uh, if you could learn to spell, it would make things easier for you. Now don't start in with that. 
Any child can tell you that English spelling is ludicrous and should be simplified. Mr. Roosevelt agreed that a gradual conversion to the phonetic system would be beneficial for all those concerned. <laughs> Simplified spelling is all right enough, but uh, like chastity, you can carry it too far. <laughs> You're leaving, Mark? Well, yes, I believe it's time to go. <laughs> well, hmm. take care, boy, and uh, don't do anything I would. Goodbye. Goodbye, Mr. Clem. Bye. Swing low, sweet chariot. Bye. Coming for to carry me home. Swing low, sweet chariot. Well, as Mr. Twain mentioned, you've been very active in the field of, of world peace. How is it that you became involved? I have always considered war a hateful and unnecessary waste. I believe that the, the leaders, the emperor and kings could initiate or forestall aggression. Uh, I put my time and influence into uh, societies for the prevention of war. I had faith in the nobler abs uh, aspects of mankind. I made the acquaintance of distinguished and powerful men who would become members of the societies of peace. I protest the continued buildup of armaments. Wasn't Carnegie Steel under contract with the government to provide armaments? Uh, no, not armaments. Uh, steel plates, a completely defensive item. But during the Spanish-American War, which you so vehemently denounced, uh, Carnegie Company was under contract with the government. A contract negotiated long before the war had ever begun. <coughs> After the initial task of your wealth, of the distributing of your wealth was done, what did you do? Well, uh, after the, in the initial task of my wealth was done, I uh, put my whole soul into the cause of world peace. Uh, I sponsored Mr. Roosevelt's tour of Europe and the building of the Hague Peace Palace. Uh, I uh, sincerely believed that through negotiations and agreements, war could be outlawed. Oh, but surely, Mr. Carnegie, a man who had seen so many business alliances made and broken couldn't have put so much faith in diplomatic agreements. I did. I had that faith, or more likely, that dream. I saw the, the Kaiser, a man who had kept peace in Germany for 28 years, uh, a powerful, intelligent man. I saw uh, Theodore Roosevelt, President of the United States, with the Kaiser. These two men together, along with other representatives of major powers, uh, striving for peace. Uh, I was sure that somehow peace would come from this gathering, and that eventually the Hague Temple would earn its name, and there would be an end to hostility. But it didn't end. But it didn't end. War came faster and more horribly than I had imagined possible. The Kaiser died, and Roosevelt turned out to be a warmonger. We had to leave Skibo Castle in that spring. <clears throat> the gardens and grounds had never been more tranquil and lovely. I can still see it in my mind's eye. The uh, sun came down, and shone clear and strong on the old on the old stone and kick and and uh, there were thick shadows on the uh, thick grass it was hard to imagine that uh, across the channel the slaughter had begun morley came and saw us off two men sitting in a hotel room speaking long into the night i never saw morley or skibo again. The voyage home took forever. We crawled along, expecting at every moment to feel the impact of a torpedo against our hull. When the sun set, all lights were extinguished. Uh, huddled together, Louise sick most of the time, uh, we waited out the cheerless night. Meanwhile, the war raged on in Europe. 
and not the kind of war that I had always imagined. A, a conflict created out of the greed and mismanagements of willful rulers? <laughs> no. The people wanted war. War fever was high and it spread like a plague across Europe. We got home and the news was always the same. Annihilation. Moistful, continued annihilation. Of all the articles and books you've ever published, none has been reproduced more than a small note that you wrote to yourself when you were a young businessman. And I quote, 33 and an income of $50,000 per annum. By this time, two years, I can so arrange all my business as to secure at least $50,000 a year. Beyond this, never earn. Make no effort to increase fortune, but spend surplus each year for benevolent purposes. Settle in Oxford and get a thorough education, making the acquaintance of literary men. Settle in London and purchase a controlling interest in a newspaper or a live review and give the general management of it attention taking part in not only public matters, but those that deal with the betterment of the poor. Man must have an idol. The amassing of wealth is one of the worst species of idolatry. No idol more debasing than that of money. Whatever I engage in, I must push inordinately. Therefore, I should be careful to choose that life which will be most elevating in its character. To continue much longer, overwhelmed by business cares, and with most of my thoughts wholly upon the way to make more money in the shortest time, must degrade me beyond hope of permanent recovery. I will resign business at the age of 35. Mr. Carnegie, surely this document is unique in the history of finance. What made you continue to amass wealth? What made you ignore this note and make money your goal? I know the note you speak of. <clears throat> comes back to me often. But, but let me ask you a question. If I had not made all that money, would you care what I've done with my life? Would I be here right now? I think not. Yes, I, the, my, my sin has been my savior. I made money, and more money, more money than any one man could possibly use. My whole life I spent accumulating wealth. I, I expanded, developed, concentrated, and controlled an industry. I created, I made money. M my goal, it never ruled me. It was never my idol. There were, the goal, money was never my goal. I never set out to make more money than a, a Rockefeller or a Morgan or anyone. It was, it was a vehicle. I used, but it never controlled me. When I was a child, I had nothing. We came across the, the ocean on that first endless... The new world was an opportunity for me, but for my father, was simply a reaffirmation to his decline. I watched his spirit sicken and die. He no longer took interest in the things around him. He stepped down as leader of the household. He couldn't get work. He scraped and scrounged in that filthy Pittsburgh slum. My mother, my brother Tom and I did. And I made a promise to myself that, that I would rise up and carry my family out of the soot. I did rise. Faster than I had expected or hoped possible. I, I worked hard, I did. I, I thought ahead, I planned. I had talent, I, I knew, but no more talent than hundreds of other people. There were three things that made me successful. Curiosity, I took an interest in the things around me. Drive, I strove and pushed hard. And luck, fate and circumstance were good, good to me. 
the age of 33, I had secured a fortune upon which me and my family could live comfortably for the rest of me. But it wasn't enough, and it wasn't the money. I had to push inordinately in whatever direction I chose. And I chose Steve. Mine was a politically active background. My father and his friends taught me young to be a radical chartist and despise hereditary monarchy. My childhood desire was to become a man and kill a king. But it wasn't true. I didn't want to kill a king. I wanted to become one. And that's how I used money, because money was power. Money was the great equalizer. I created a business. I amassed an empire. And I gave my fortune away. Because the money meant nothing, nothing.